I am Tony Comiti, journalist. I encountered and recorded Pablo Escobar. The Medellin Cartel, it is a criminal organization that was responsible for running the entire worldwide trafficking operation. She is held by the Ochoa family and the Escobar family. To meet those people, obviously it's not easy. You don't just call for an appointment. I reached out to a few Colombian journalists. The first one told me, watch out, the Medellin cartel has killed 80 Colombian journalists. Anyone who messes with traffic is fair game. The henchmen of the Medellin cartel, you can witness them every single night at the Intercontinental Hotel in Medellin, Colombia. It is impossible to miss them as they are wearing white hats and are armed. And they have white ponchos and white Toyotas or 4X4S parked at the entrance of the hotel. So I went to Medellin, I arrived at the Intercontinental Hotel, I got a room and I started to approach them. I started talking like, hey, I'm a French journalist, I'd love to meet Pablo Escobar. Don't forget that at the time, Pablo Escobar is on the run. He's wanted by police forces all over the world. The Colombian narcs, the American narcs, and even the French narcs. They said, listen, we'll relay the message. He requests my contact info, then I return to Paris. A few months later, I get a phone call. You should return to Colombia. Then, on a beautiful morning, I witnessed four guys arrive at the hotel. They approached me directly. He tells me, French journal? I'm telling you, damn, he'll flip, gonna kill me, that guy. He says, come on, let's go, let's go. We got into a convoy of 4x4S. Then we proceeded to a hacienda. And there, to our astonishment, it was not Pablo Escobar, but rather Fabio Ochoa who greeted us. We were taken aback by this unexpected encounter and eagerly awaited to hear what he had to say. And we spent approximately one month and a half in the center of the Ochoa family. They exhibited and unveiled to us every single thing their extraordinary and breathtaking property located on the coast of the Caribbean Sea. Their planes, their lab. We filmed it all. It was incredible. Every time I think, why are they letting us record this? John Bertolino and Fabio Ochoa got along well. And one beautiful morning, Don Fabio Ochoa desires to demonstrate to me the location where his father is laid to rest. We're going to a cemetery, and there, it's unbelievable, he talks about his father and he starts crying. This man, responsible for deaths, talks about his father with a tear on his face. It's not a fake tear, but genuine emotion, as he reflects on the lives lost. I will always remember that. We return to the cars. I was relaxing in Fabio's car, while the remaining members of the crew were in a car with armed bodyguards positioned all around. The motorcade halts and Don Fabio approaches my window. On the upcoming day, we have an interview scheduled with Don Pablo. But which Pablo? Pablo Escobar. And on the subsequent day, we departed at approximately 7 p.m. Scarves were placed on our heads. Finally, we reached this small road, just like that, which happened to be the entrance leading to the Nacienda. I open the door and I slyly activate my camera because Fabio, you know, instructs me, definitely do not film. Say what you want, but I am recording. I had the camera activated beneath my arm and there were approximately 50 young killers giving us a guard of honor as they formed a protective line. And at the end of the hallway, there is a pool for swimming. And at the end of that pool, there's this little guy kind of chubby, not very tall, with a green cap on his head, who comes up to me and says, Pablo Escobar. It was the son of Ochoa who initiated the conversation, and it was evident that Escobar was displeased with the remarks made by Ochoa's son. So he slowly approached the goal of my camera, like that, and then sat down. We are going to interview him for approximately one hour. And at one point, we reach the end of the tape. Beep, beep, beep. I put my hand in the cookie jar and I hear a 9mm gun barrel right behind my neck. It was a mess of a body. 16 years old, 17 years old. Kim pulls a gun and Escobar goes, oh, chill out, man. And at the conclusion of the interview, Escobar seized hold of my arm and uttered, Don Tony. He called me Don Tony, you know. Don Tony. Usted es Corsica, ¿eh? 
Yeah, yeah, Don Pablo, but you know how it is. Intelligence gathering is also my gig. And as he greeted me because he was heading somewhere, he said to me, well, Don Tony, come back and see me. Drugs are my passion. That is the final thing I heard from this interview. We had an agreement with the Medellin cartel. It was to display the film prior to its release. Upon my arrival at La Loma, I entered the courtyard and was greeted by the sight of at least 44 people eagerly anticipating the commencement of the event. Every single one of them was in attendance, with the sole exception being the absence of Pablo Escobar. They all came to watch the movie, Roberto Escobar, Pablo's brother and his crew, the high maintenance kids, the beautiful sisters, the women despised us during the shoot. They sensed the danger of this movie for them. They didn't understand why these people, the most wanted in the world, would agree to be filmed. And so the viewing begins, Don Fabio Centillo sitting next to, and behind the whole cartel, and the film has just started. And there, it's unbelievable, I'm looking at Don Fabio in astonishment. He had drifted off to sleep during the screening. The movie is now over. The end of the movie is particularly awful because they conduct an interview with Fabio Ochoa and Bertolino aggressively questions him. But actually, Fabio, the real boss of Medellin, it's not Pablo Escobar, it's you. And the answer in the interview is yes, yes, yes. And he dozes off. And Roberto Escobar stands up and he says to Fabio, he is correct, the Frenchman, the true leader of Medellin, it is you. All right, see ya. He's out of here. The girl Ochoa gets up furious. She gives me a dirty look and she says to her father, Dad, if this movie comes out, we'll all be extradited to the United States. He listens to his daughter. He grabs me by the arm, really strong like that. He drags me into the corridor. He says to me, you will tell Bertolini, wherever he is in the world, his ancestors, his descendants before him, you tell him and you too. Don Fabio, me, I am a technician. And he tells me, you're a very skilled technician. I said, no problemo, Don Fabio, no problemo. I get in the taxi, I'm like, damn, they're going to kill me, take me hostage. I don't know what they're going to do. And there's my taxi waiting in the Sienda courtyard. The guy was shaking because he recognized all those people. He was shaking like that. We're going down Sienda Lane and there's this white Toyota that's blocking us, blocking us in front, blocking us in the back. And it is Ochoa's youngest son who opens the door. I said, that is it. I am kidnapped. I am kidnapped. He is asking me, what is the value? What is the value? Sorry, he says, what is the value? One M, two M, three M dollars. How much is this worth? The movie. He shuts the door and the cars blocked us for 10 minutes. Those were the longest 10 minutes of my life. The taxi was muttering, we're dead, we're dead. At last, I managed to depart. I successfully reached the hotel accommodation First plane, Paris. Actually, in the movie, there's this crazy scene where during Pablo Escobar's interview, the whole damn BDI cartel is sitting at the table. It is the gang. And that, my friend, is extradition to the good old United States of America. Colombian traffickers choose grave in our country over prison in the U.S. Don't forget, they prefer it that way. So Patrick Lelay, back then the boss of TF1, obviously decided not to release the movie. And the movie came out after Escobar's death, that is to say a year and a half later, on TF1's show 52 on the Moon.